Good afternoon, folks. As many of you know, my name is Davis Taylor. I teach economics here. My turn to do the core course talk. I timed this out and it came out to about 45, 50 minutes. It'll probably go a little bit longer when you do something live. It tends to go a little bit longer. But there definitely will be time for questions at the end. So prepare your questions, please. Oh, there goes the mic. Um, talk a little bit about get this to work. Where we've been. Uh, we've been tying together all the talks, so I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna represent the tying together of the previous talks in the context of engagement, how we engage with the world, and representation, how we represent the world. So John talked about being deeply immersed in the world. That wasn't that funny, was it? John spoke of being deeply immersed in the world and telling stories, like Annie Dillard does. Catherine spoke of uh, wonder and sublimity. Uh, she also talked about maps and cartography as a way of representing the world. Rich spoke of the history uh, that is behind the college and behind human ecology and the uh, people who came before. And so you can sort of think of that in the, in the context of uh, engaging in a field like human ecology based on history. He also had those two circles, the big circle that's the world and the little circle that's our minds. And so that's a representation of how we uh, can think about how human ecology works. Darren spoke about engaging in the world by knowing something really well, by having skills, by using your hands, things like that. He also spoke about human ecology as a continual ethnography. As, as a way of knowing the world, uh, engaging in it. Don asked if there's anything that we really know about the way we think about the world, and he talked about the uncertainty of the way we model the world, the way we represent the world through models, and how there's a lot of uncertainty in the context of things like climate change. And then Sean spoke of whales. <laughs> and the cultural creation of whales, so representation of the world that is more cultural than actual physical, but he also spoke of how we engage with whales themselves, these giant, potentially very, excuse me, old creatures, and so the actual engagement with the world in that context. After I did the thing with Sean, I decided it was only fair to do it with the rest of the faculty. So um, John is the uh, grand wizard of Holy the Firm. Um, Catherine is the kaleidoscope of how you view the world. Uh, Rich is the uh, grand wise master of human ecology. Darren wants to be a stud mechanic. <laughs> Don, of course, is the mad scientist, and then there's Don. So this is a little bit of where we've been. Colleagues, forgive me, please. <laughs> and someone should have some fun with me in the next two weeks. Uh, Jay, it's on you to um, continue this. So where we're going, what do I want to do with this talk today? I want to show how a highly disciplinary subject like economics fits into human ecology. Okay, I'm not trying to turn all of you into human ecology. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to turn you all into human ecologists. I'm not trying to turn you all into economists. Economics is just one example. It happens to be one of the more disciplinary disciplines out there. And so we'll see how that fits into human ecology. And kind of a converse, demonstrate how one can build human ecology from a disciplinary base. So that's the objective of the talk today, and that's how I'm going to kind of walk us through some ideas. Our departure point is economics. Okay. Economics has been called hegemonic. It's been called autistic. It's been especially called reductionist. Okay. This is a duck. It's a representation of a duck. It is a highly reductionistic representation of a duck. Reductionism is when you think you can, well, there's lots of different ways to characterize it, but one way to characterize reductionism is the idea that you can represent a totality by merely looking at the constituent components and that there is no synergy between the components, no connections. Okay, so reductionism is oftentimes a dirty word in human ecology. In human ecology, we're all about synergies, connections between things, things like that. To be reductionist is generally considered to be somewhat bad within human ecology. Economics is highly reductionistic because it uses models. Okay? We use mathematical models to represent human behavior. I should probably define economics. It has a number of different definitions, but it's generally regarded as a study 
of uh, the production, distribution, and consumption of scarce resources. So there's lots of other uh, different definitions. And pretty much any human behavior that involves scarcity has been touched upon by economists. There's economics of businesses. There's economics of how the government spends its money. But there's also economics of religion, economics of having children, the decision to have children, and all kinds of little arcane things in between. So the economists get everywhere uh, that humans go, so to speak. And they do this with models. Okay? This is an equation from my dissertation. It is uh, very typical of mathematics used in mainstream economics, which is usually referred to as neoclassical economics. This happens to be a statistical model, but it's very typical of the sort of uh, mathematics that is used in economics and makes economics highly reductionistic. However, the models have their purposes. This is a slum in Nairobi. Uh, slums are complex places. And you might say it's somewhat dangerous to represent a slum or things having to do with slums uh, with models. But they're big problems, too. And their complexity suggests that they're not quite as simple as we might say. They're not the, the absolute evil uh, that they're sometimes pictured as. But nevertheless, we can see, I mean, slums are just bad. Okay, we, this is a bad thing. Several years ago, the world population tipped from being more rural to being more urban, and hundreds of millions of people live in slums in conditions like this. The way we think about slums has changed radically over the past 20 or 30 years because of this model. Okay? This is a model of urban-rural migration, and it had tremendous impact on how policymakers, government officials, NGOs, how all these people look at slums and what you should do about slums, favelas, shanty towns, things like that. Okay? So, the models are really powerful. They can do really good things. And a lot of people might say, how can you represent this with this? But it works. This is actually one of the favorite models of students in my economic development class. Uh, we take about, a, well, at least one full class to go through it. It's a complex model, but it really shows some, some um, interesting things in terms of urban-rural migration decisions. And people really seem to embrace it after they understand it. So, it's powerful stuff. Whoops. Oh, I should, I'm, I'm going to point out some of the people who are working in these areas. This is Esther Duflo. She does incredible work uh, as an economist looking at uh, poverty and shanty towns and things like that. This is a very influ influential book that she co authored. So she's one of the people who are working on this kind of stuff. Okay. So, thinking about models, thinking about its highly disciplinary way of looking at the world and a way that could be, could be called very reductionistic, I usually emphasize three things to my students. Okay, three things we can say about models. The first one was quoted in one of Don's readings. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Another way of saying that is models are dangerous because they leave things out. Models are powerful because they leave things out. Here's another model. It's a very simple model. It's another favorite from the economic development class. And it's a really powerful model. It clearly leaves a lot of things out. A cool thing about leaving things out, though, is also you can use a simple model like this to explain all kinds of different phenomena. This particular model goes a long ways towards explaining poverty in Africa, why young people are flocking away from Washington County, which is the county between here and Canada, and why you might have had a little trouble getting people together to build your egg throwing machines. Okay, So it's a simple model, but when you strip away the details of a situation and see the fundamental patterns beneath it, sometimes you go, wow, this situation appears everywhere. You have to be careful with this. It's said that when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. So you don't want to use this model alone, but it really does a good job of stripping things down. It is wrong because it leaves out information. All models leave out information so that you can focus on key ideas, and that's what makes it powerful. You can think about a roadmap. A roadmap, well, suppose you had the task, one task of driving across downtown Boston, another task of driving across the United States. You have a Rand McNally road, map, road atlas of the interstate system and a map of downtown Boston. If you use the wrong map, 
for the wrong task, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay, you have to make sure the information that you're leaving out in a model is the right stuff, and that can be tricky. Misapplication of models has caused tremendous problem in economics and around the world. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. The second thing we can say is that we use models not because we're smart, but because we're not smart enough. Okay? This is a fairly simple model. It's got two lines, a straight one and a curvy one. The one before, sorry, Esther. This has more lines. Okay? I like to think of the lines as storing an idea. Each line stores an idea. There's a lot of ideas on here. There's a lot of lines. Each one of these little side lines means something, too. W bar means something. W star M means something. So the lines that connect them to the intersection points are important ideas, too. Each line stores an idea, and then you put it on the graph, and you can kind of forget about it for a while. As long as you have faith and confidence in what that line is representing, the relationship that is, that is showing, you can put it on the graph and then leave it and start putting other lines representing other ideas into the model. It gets really complicated very quickly. But this illustrated ideas in ways that people hadn't really been able to conceptualize before they saw the model. So again, we use models not because we're smart, but because we're not smart enough. Hi, Esther. OK, third thing to say about models, models start conversations. The models themselves can be very cool, but the whole idea behind models is that they get you talking about stuff. They get you thinking about, well, what's going on here, and why is it like this, and where does it apply? It applies in Africa, and Washington County, and COA group projects. How does that work? Even if you're criticizing the model and saying, I don't think it really applies, it gets you thinking about things. And I've had so many students, especially in that urban-rural migration model, who have said, you know, I didn't really understand the ideas about, say, urban-rural migration until I understood the model. The model gets you thinking, and that starts conversations, and you go places from there. So three things about models. A fundamental part of a discipline. I hope that wasn't me beeping. Um, the takeaway point is that thinking deeply is an important part of transdisciplinarity. And Max Neef mentioned this, mentions this in his writing. It's kind of buried amongst a lot of deep thoughts. But he emphasizes, amongst other things, that to be transdisciplinary also includes having disciplinary strength. And I think part of human ecology is starting with disciplinary strength, whether it's counting birds or understanding the Human Genome Project or really diving into 19th century art history or any of those things. It's important to have disciplinary excellence in some way, shape, or form. To this, we expand. Or we add within the discipline. Okay? Ecological economics is an expansion beyond neoclassical economics that makes economics better and stronger. Okay? So that's why I had you read the reading on ecological economics. I want to share a couple ideas from ecological economics to get you interested in it. And also, I'm going to take these ideas someplace uh, in, in a little bit. Ecological economics is about scale. That's one of the most fundamental concepts within ecological economics. And one way to capture the scale that some of you are probably familiar with is the ecological footprint concept. It's not a very exact way of measuring things, but the idea is we can calculate in a crude way how much land it would take to produce the resources needed to keep one person alive, okay? and also how much land would be needed to get rid of the pollution that that person produces. So however much land that is for you, that would be your ecological footprint. And the ecological footprint of Americans, you know, United States citizens, is very high. The ecological footprint of people living in Africa, for the most part, is very low. You can calculate ecological footprints for people, for communities, for states, and for nations. Okay, so it's just a crude way of seeing how much resource you're, you're using, how much land you're using in, in the context of resources. And it's not an exact measurement. Uh, for Americans, typically, and these numbers are probably a little bit old, but most Americans are at about five, well, actually, let me back up. Another way to, to conceptualize the ecological footprint, instead of how much land it would take, is how many planets we would need if everybody lived like person X. OK, so we could say that if everybody lived like you, we would need this many planets. Uh, to, to feed and clothe and house and provide goods and service, services to the entire population of the world. Okay. For most Americans, their, their ecological footprint is five planets. 
Okay? If everybody in the world lived like a United States citizen, we would need five planets. Okay. Of course, COA students are much better at this. We're much more ecologically conscious, so we're down at about two and a half planets here, which is just fine. This is a quick little graphic that uh, shows how resource use, use such as measured by ecological footprints, uh, fits in with human development. The horizontal line shows uh, all the countries below the line are those countries that are living within their ecological footprint, within um, a, their, the, a proper biocapacity. Okay? All the countries to the right of the vertical line have what's considered to be an appropriate level of human development. So we have a lot of rich countries that have good human development, but they're using way more resources than they should. And we have a lot of poor countries that are not using a lot of resources, but do not have satisfactory levels of human development. We have one country that manages to do it both. Anybody want to hazard a guess? It's got to be a kind of a poor country, too, but doing good. Cuba. OK, Cuba's not a perfect place. It's got some problems. but they're doing some cool things in Cuba. So um, that's an interesting situation in terms of how we use our resources, our scale of impact on the planet. And it's kind of not the best situation in the world. Okay. The next concept that I'll share with you is Jevons paradox. William Stanley Jevons was an economist working in the 19th century. He was looking at the efficiency of steam engines in the context of how much coal they use. And he noticed that the steam engines of the 19th century were getting more and more efficient. And so it took less and less coal to get a certain amount of work out of a steam engine. But this did not lead to the consumption of less coal. It led to a greater use of coal. Okay, so that's the paradox. The engines were getting more and more efficient. But instead of the resource use going down because of the improvements in efficiency, the resource use went up. Jevons' paradox has been seen in various contexts, and it's probably there in terms of how Americans drive. Um, as our mileage, as, as our cars have gotten more efficient, we're driving many, many more miles. There's a little bit of good news down here. We're driving a little bit less, and uh, if you continue this out another couple of years, we are driving less, even though uh, gasoline prices are dirt cheap right now. So there's a little bit of good news, but this pretty much illustrates the Jevons' paradox. The Jevons paradox, in turn, is an example of a larger phenomena called the rebound effect. And this is also studied in ecological economics. The rebound effect can be illustrated by a noble COA student who lives in town in Bar Harbor and decides she's going to help save the planet by walking, in, walking into school, okay. save some gas, and you know, hopefully um, help the planet out of its carbon use problems, climate change, things like that. There's other reasons to walk into town. It's good for you. It's, you can socialize with your friends more and things like that. But it's still a, perhaps a significant motivation is to save the planet by using less carbon. OK, well, if our noble COA student does this and enough other people do this, that's going to have an impact, a positive impact, which is a good thing. However, by using less gasoline, the laws of supply and demand kick in and the price of gasoline goes down. What happens when the price of gasoline goes down? Other people buy more gasoline. So our noble COA student is kind of subsidizing the large SUV driver. Okay? Now, not all of what she saves by walking in, into school is going to be used by the SUV driver, but quite a bit of it is. So we have these situations that are studied within ecological economics where we try to have conservation, or we try to have efficiency, but sometimes it doesn't work quite as well as we thought it would. Okay. Another thing that's talked about in ecological economics is technological lock-in. This is a QWERTY keyboard. Uh, as many of you know, it's referred to QWERTY because it's got the Q, W, E, R, T, Y. It's the only word you can really come up with on a standard keyboard. Okay. The, key, the QWERTY keyboard has been around since the 1870s. It was designed to help you type slow, OK? The problem with mechanical typewriters back in the day was that if people type too fast, the keys got stuck. And if you typed from letters that were on the same side of the array of keys, they would get stuck if they went into the ribbon and the paper at the same time. So Remington designed the QWERTY keyboard specifically to type slow. Of course, 
the, the QWERTY keyboard is still with us now, even though we don't want to type slow. And by some estimates, there are other arrangements of keyboards that could raise our, the, the speed of our typing, the efficiency of our typing, by up to 700%. But we were locked into QWERTY because it is the keyboard that people know, it is the keyboard that manufacturers know. If manufacturers were to try to change keyboards, that would be costly to try to coordinate, and there'd be competing versions and things like that. So QWERTY is a simple example of technological lock-in. The internal combustion engine is another example of technological lock-in. It is really not an efficient way to move big hunks of metal with people inside them, but we're stuck with it, okay? And uh, in the 60s and 70s, Mazda tried to introduce the rotary, automo uh, the rotary engine, a much more efficient engine, and it just didn't really take off. And there's, there's many other ways to more efficiently move a uh, vehicle. So technological lock-in is a problem. We're kind of stuck with certain technologies, even if better technologies come along. Okay. Related to technological lock-in is institutional or cultural lock-in. And this is an important con uh, concept in ecological economics. And it gets into another field that I do quite a bit of work in called new institutional economics. Okay. In this context, institutions are the rules of the game. And you can have formal institutions, such as laws, contracts, constitutions, property rights, things like that. But there are also informal institutions that dictate how people behave uh, within an economy. And that's just culture, norms, expectations, how you're supposed to behave. These rules go a long way towards explaining how economies work and whether they succeed or fail, and also maybe depending on what you're trying to succeed and fail at. Okay? It is really challenging to change institutions. The formal ones, like constitutions and laws, have people who are invested in the status quo. Okay? You are investing in the current status quo. You're going to college assuming that the economy is going to work in a certain way, that property rights and the labor market, and your employment opportunity, all these things are going to work in a certain way. And if someone came along and suddenly tried to change those rules, those laws, you would probably feel a little bit upset. Okay. Large corporations, small businesses, everybody is invested in the status quo and tends to resist changes to the status quo. The changes can be really good for the planet or the country or some larger community, but people give that some weight, but they also mostly look at their own interests. Okay. And so even if it's good for the planet to change the rules, such as moving from a growth-based economy to a more sustainable and resilient economy, there's a lot of resistance to that, and that's what we see all around us today. The informal institutions are even harder to change. Okay. You are expected to behave in certain ways. You're expected to consume in certain patterns, depending on what country you live in. And to step off those uh, norms and expectations to, for example, try to live a less consumptive lifestyle can be really challenging. Okay. We can get away with a lot here at COA. You can wear funky clothes and do funky things and be low consumption. But there's lots of places in the world where if you don't drive the right, well, I should say lots of places in the United States where if you don't drive the right car, wear the right clothes, do the right vacations, things like that, you're going to lose your friends, you're going to lose your job. Okay? So we are sort of locked into our cultural norms. I was building a house a few years ago, and I wanted to put in a composting toilet. And my mom just said, nope, not going to visit. So no composting toilet. I was willing to go there, but mom wasn't, and I like my mom. so. Um, a lot of great institutional economics. Where's my? Oh, that's the point. There we go. A lot of great institutional economics is done by Eleanor Ostrom. She won the Nobel Prize in 2010, or two, 2010. Uh, an amazing uh, political economist. Uh, she's sort of one of the hallowed saints of human ecology. When we had the Society for Human Ecology conference here uh, a year or two ago. Her name was mentioned quite a bit. If you are working in fisheries management at a micro level or climate change at a macro level, you're probably using ideas that were uh, initially proposed and advocated by Eleanor Ostrom, so a really amazing woman. Uh, she died a couple of years ago, unfortunately. So let's see. The next thing we do. So we're building a human ecological perspective from a highly disciplinary foundation. We started with the disciplinary depth and rigor that models give us in economics, and then we talked about expanding ec within economics by bringing in ecological economics and new institutional economics. Now 
I'm going to talk about going into other disciplines, what I call the border disciplines, and this is where cooperation comes in. And the reason I ask you to read the piece on cooperation by Benkler is it really illustrates how you can be talking about something like the economy and economics, but you begin to lean on things like sociology, anthropology, psychology, things like that. Okay. I teach a lot about cooperation and cooperatives, and I'm definitely not an expert at sociology or psychology or, or uh, uh, evolutionary biology. These are all things that, that I come across when I'm doing cooperation. And that's something you have to grapple with. But it, it definitely makes economics stronger, and it is part of a human ecological perspective. One thing, um, just a few ideas quickly about cooperation. Uh, it really is important not just for in, in ways we want to might change the economy, but also our current economy really relies quite a bit on cooperation. There's so much trust in the economy. You cannot write a perfect contract between two people. And since you cannot write a perfect contract that covers every single contingency, there has to be trust. So trust, cooperation, norms of reciprocity, really interesting stuff. Okay. Oh, there's all kinds of cool graphics on the internet about cooperation, so I just found a few of them. Um, so to kind of summarize some of the, the, the ideas beyond the construction of this human ecological perspective, we can say that ecological and new institutional economics tells us that change is really hard to accomplish. We've got technological lock-in. We've got uh, institutional lock-in. We see change all around us. But fundamentally changing our economy in ways to say, for example, put us on a more sustainable path are quite a challenge. It may seem like it's hard to change people's minds about civil rights or marriage equality or some of the other uh, sorts of issues that have been floating around for the past 10 or 15 years, but those are really much more easy to change than norms and expectations and investments that have to do with people's economic livelihood. So change is hard to accomplish in, in lots of contexts. Okay? A good crisis helps. Nothing like a crisis, a world war, for example, to get people to come together and say, I guess we better do things differently. Apparently, however, we haven't had the right crisis yet. Okay? If you add it all up, the situation is pretty bleak. Okay? It's hard to change. We've got some problems in the world. And we've got things like Jevons paradox. And our ecological footprint is, is way too high. And th these are just real problems. And then you run into something like never running out of oil. Okay. I wanted you to read uh, What If We Never Run Out of Oil, because I wanted you to really grapple with these problems of our success. Okay. We have a real climate change challenge because we have gotten so good at finding hydrocarbons. We have institutional arrangements within the US and European economies, the Japanese economy, closely being followed by lots of economies in Asia. Latin America, Africa is not far behind. They all want the institutional structures that are going to promote growth, that are going to promote technological innovation of the sort that allows us to find more oil constantly, constantly more oil. And this good news, that, or what used to be called good news, is now kind of bad news. Okay? I think the most important line from this reading was by the energy economist who sighed and said, I wouldn't bet on us making the right choices. Okay, So I hope you sort of took that reading and kind of took a deep breath and maybe said, wow, this is a little depressing. Um, we'll see. Now, I'm not really trying to get everybody depressed. Okay, we'll, go, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But unfortunately, we're, we're, we haven't even talked about the whole big picture yet. We've been focusing on sort of ecological things, resource use, things of that nature. And I really struggled with whether I should pre uh, present the next little bit of information, but I talked with some students who are familiar with it, and they encouraged me to go ahead and do so. So here we go. Um, we haven't really even talked about the regular economy. Okay. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good news in the regular economy either. Right now, between 2008 and now, things have gotten a little bit better. But there's some real problems out there. And uh, we cover these in, in my macroeconomics class. And I decided that it's probably a good idea to share with you. So I'm going to run through a little uh, sort of uh, visual representation here of a problem that's kind of out there uh, within the macroeconomy. It is something that I think within human ecology we have to address. 
We're going to look at money, okay? And we're going to look at money in the context of debt. In particular, we're going to look at how much money the U.S. government owes. The U.S. government does not collect enough taxes in order to pay its bills, in order to pay for uh, Medicare and the defense and uh, education, healthcare, things like that. All these expenses that the U.S. government has, it doesn't have enough money to pay for it, so it borrows. And it basically doesn't use a credit card, but you can imagine it just like a credit card. So we're going to look at the credit card uh, that uh, the U.S. government and the U.S. government is using. Sorry. So, whoops, too fast. So that's $100, and that's $10,000. Now, if the bills are brand new, they stack nice and flat and everything, you get a nice little wad of money like that, okay? Um, this is a million dollars, okay? Surprisingly small amount of money. You know, it could fit it right here, okay? So a million dollars doesn't take up much space. This is $100 million, okay? It could fit on one pallet. You know, we could put it right here, okay? No problem having $100 million. Darren, what's our, what's our endowment right around here? Yeah. 55. <laughs> 55, okay, so COA's endowment is half a pallet. We got half a pallet, but we're gonna get more. Okay, so there's $100 million. Take 10 of those, and you got a billion dollars. Okay. Again, not a lot of money. Could easily fit that in gates, right here. You know, move a few chairs aside, have an ACM around it, things like that. Um, a billion dollars is 10 times 100 million, okay? So far, not a lot of money. Now when we start adding zeros, though, things get a little dicey. Here's a trillion, okay? That's a trillion dollars in $100 bills on pallets. Here's, a, here's the same amount with a different view. We've got the White House there and a football field and a 747, so that's a trillion dollars on pallets. Here's where it gets tough. How much money does the US government owe? <laughs> well, when this graphic was done, it owed this much. This is $15 trillion. But I checked this morning, and we're up to 18, billion, uh, 18 trillion, 400 billion and change. There's a clock. You can easily find it on the internet. Um, it's going up all the time. So we actually owe about 20% more than this now. Okay. So that's a lot of money. One more slide. I'm really sorry. In addition to the money we owe, there's the money that we know we're going to owe in the future. The money we're obligated to pay. The government has said, we will pay you your Social Security. We will pay you your uh, Medicare, your Medicaid, your veterans benefits, all these things. It's kind of tricky how you calculate this. There's lots of different ways. It kind of involves an infinite time horizon. So there's lots of different estimates. But a conservative estimate is this. That's $120 trillion. Okay. I've seen estimates by reputable economists. In fact, the number I hear most often is $205 trillion. Okay. So there's climate change, <laughs> and there's too much oil, but there's other problems out there, too. There's three ways we can pay this off, incidentally. How am I doing? OK. Um, three ways to get rid of this kind of deficit. One thing is we could just spend less money, have, have the government spend less money, uh, and raise taxes. And that would do, do the trick. That's, how, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay. There was a time when Great Britain had a debt of this magnitude. Uh, this is about 100% of the US GDP, the amount of goods and services we produce in one year. Okay. And at one point, Great Britain had a, a, a debt right after the, the Napoleonic Wars that was about 100% of its GDP, and it paid it off. It took about 100 years. It took an empire. That helped. And it probably impoverished a lot of people in Britain. They could have spent that money on lots of good things, but instead they paid back their debt. Um, I, the problem is our inability to raise taxes and lower government spending is what got us to the 15 or 18 trillion. So to see that change anytime soon, doesn't seem very likely. The second thing we could do is print money. Okay, We could just print a ton of money. And this has been done throughout history in many uh, ways, shapes, and forms. We could print 18 $1 trillion bills. Okay? We could, or maybe it would be better to print a couple hundred billion dollar bills, maybe a, you know, a sheep this big, and just pay it off. We owe China about a trillion dollars, 1.3 trillion, I think, is the last I saw. 
why a rich country like the US owes the Chinese a poor country $1.3 trillion is a little bit of a mystery. There's macroeconomic reasons for it. But we could just print money, OK? This would be pretty much an economic disaster, OK? The reason people are willing to loan us this much money in the first place is because they trust the US government and the US Federal Reserve, the US Treasury, to not print money. If we started printing money in an appreciable fashion to pay off this debt, I, it's hard to fathom what, exactly what would happen, but it wouldn't be good. The entire faith of, of people, I talked about trust being an important part of a market economy. All that trust would disappear, or at least a lot of it. Money would become worthless, and it would not be a pretty situation. It would be an economic disaster. The third way, however, is worse. We could simply default. We could say, we're not going to pay it. Countries do this every now and again. They're usually smaller countries. Um, Argentina defaulted around 1999, 1998. Uh, that was about the biggest country that's, that's defaulted recently. Um, and if the US government defaulted on this debt, it would be cataclysmic. It would be disastrous. Thousands, tens of thousands of businesses would go out of business right away. I'd have to think the college would shut down within a month or so. Um, we, we would, it would just be the end of days. So I don't think that's really an option either. Okay. So we've got this little thing here to, to be concerned about. Okay. Uh, this, by the way, is Kyman Reinhardt. She's an economist who does great work in the area of financial crises. All financial crises are debt driven, so she does a lot of work on debt too. Um, I think both she and Esther Duflo are candidates for, for Nobel Prizes. Uh, they're just doing fantastic work. So she's done a lot in this area. So the takeaways from this. I'm going to drink of water. When you study economics, whether it's neoclassical macroeconomics or ecological economics or new institutional economics, or for that matter, John made a reference to seeing all kinds of species extinctions and how that could be kind of uh, depressing. This is, this is really not fun. There's a lot of things out there that make the world look bad. So I am not an optimist. And when Darren said he was an optimist, I was just shaking my head in my seat, just going, ah, good for you, Darren. Um, <laughs> but I am not an optimist, OK? I'd have to say I'm a pessimist. Okay? And I've thought this through a lot. How, you know, I mean, should I even be sharing this with you? And you know, should I just sort of sweep it under the rug and just not let anybody know about it, not let people know about it in my economics classes? And I just can't. You know? and, and I've also sort of asked, like, well, am I just a pessimist because I'm Davis, and Davis is sort of a dark pessimistic kind of guy. But I talk to my students about this, and the ones who take the advanced seminar in ecological economics, they pretty much agree, no, that's, that's the situation. And the students who take macro, yeah, they pretty much agree, too, that this, you know, it's, it's as bad as it looks. Okay? So it's not my goal to like, scare the hell out of people and just be dark and gloomy. I think this is part of human ecology. I think you have to grapple with the world's problems. And the world's problems to you might be not enough seagulls, or too many seagulls, or not enough turns, or too many turns. Or it might be something you're, you're, you're wrestling with in terms of your artwork, and you're trying to show some things, and you're really trying to express yourself. You're trying to sort of capture some of the, the badness in the world. Okay, there's all kinds of ways of thinking about it, but I think when we do human ecology, we have to wrestle with this. Okay, so it's, it's, the goal is not just to sort of shock and awe people into having a bad day. Uh, the goal is to sort of recognize that this is part of what we do, and there's all kinds of manifestations. I think it's also important to recognize that we are all a part of this. Okay? We are all complicit in this. It's easy to say greedy corporations, greedy rich people, things like that. Well, for one thing, most people in this room are wealthy people, OK? When you look at it in a global uh, context, we are the wealthy people in the world. But more to the point, we all could consume less. And even with the rebound effect and the Jevons paradox, our consuming less would have an impact in the world. I could consume less, and I don't. You could, cons could consume less, and you don't. The college does very little in terms of trying to consume less. We take the route that most of the world does. We try to get better technology, cleaner technology, so our footprint is smaller. But the actual idea of consuming less is something we don't really talk about. So we are, are complicit in this. We are part of this problem. And that is a really difficult thing to grapple with. 
two questions, I think, emerge from this. First of all, if there's all these really dark problems that seem rather intractable, what do you do? How do you make a difference? Okay. Secondly, what do you do personally? I mean, this is kind of shocking to, to see these problems. And again, I've focused on some economic challenges, but there's challenges in all disciplines. Uh, maybe not quite as dark as that stack of money. But how do you live personally, personally in a world of horror? Okay. I think this is where we have to bring in some of the ideas of Max and Eve. Uh, we have to talk about the world having mul things like multiple realities, things like an excluded middle. And for me, this means two particular things. First of all, I think, I guess I'm wandering around a lot. I hope I'm not making people dizzy. Yeah, I'll still. Um, I think it's important when you grapple with problems that I've illustrated here to find work that works at an appropriate scale for you. Okay. Apparently, Martin Heidegger says this, I'm told by John Visbader. Heidegger says that when you find hopelessness at a certain scale of the world, we have a tendency to find scales where we can find hope, where we can affect change. Okay. I think it's something we do naturally, and I think it's a good idea. Okay. Secondly, I think we ha have to have deep engagement. And this is, this is Michael Crawford, Matthew Crawford. Matthew Crawford, thank you. So he spoke of real knowledge, using your hands, being evaluated by your peers, things like that. Okay? I think it's important both as sort of a remedy for some of the things that are, might be going on in the so-called outside world, but it's also partly an answer to some of the problems and the way they're created. For me, my form of deep engagement with the world has come through farming and homesteading. Okay? Um, this is a farm, my, my, my first farm. Um, for me, being out, working with soil, sweating, using my muscles, learning things like how to do a scythe, how to work a scythe, um, learning how to grow plants, things like that, very much in the way that Crawford was talking about is something that gives me deep personal meaning. Okay? It's also given me that sort of understanding that Max Neef talks about. I think one of the most important parts of that reading was this idea between knowing and understanding, and he talked about this in the context of love. Okay. I know economics really well, but I came to understand some economic principles that it's really hard to describe now. It's tacit knowledge. Okay. It's difficult to describe, but by actually selling plants, selling produce, things of that nature, at farmers markets, working with other farmers, selling stuff, things like that, it really enhanced my understanding of economics. Okay. And this is a quickly a model I came up with and presented at a human ecology forum a couple of years ago. It looks at uh, expanding food systems in the context of the number of farms in a given region. And I was looking at cooperation, of course, and competition, and built a little dynamic model. It even has some calculus, yay. So doing the scything, doing the spreading of manure, selling stuff with other farmers, has, has been extremely rewarding at a personal level. It's also enhanced the way I teach and the research and I, that I do, so it's an important part of, of how I do things. This is my uh, latest effort. Before I screwed up my knee this summer, I was doing a little plowing. And you're all basically invited out to this place. There's, this is, there's not much there now, but over the next three years, three and a half years, there will be houses and more fields and fruit and nut trees and everything, and I want to um, have people out there to do the same sort of stuff that I've been doing. Of course, it does lead to some odd situations in terms of who grows your food, but um, <laughs> this does, le does leave some questions, okay? How does farming or homesteading get, get, move us towards a better world? I've asked myself, and I think perhaps I've been asked by people, am I really helping the world or am I just sort of going off and burying myself on a farm? Okay. Is there a way that these practices that I'm doing, these practices that Crawford recommends, is there a way that they're actually making the world a better place, or is it a form of escapism? I think this is a question you have to ask. Okay. And I feel pretty confident that it's a good thing that it's making the world a better place. I think we have global problems that require global activism, global solutions. So we need people doing that sort of stuff, and, and we have that here at the college, as uh, I hope you know. But the global activists also must recognize that if we're going to have political change of the scale that we need, as illustrated by some of the concepts in the talk, we have to have some cultural shifts too. 
And that has to happen, I think, or is going to happen through people demonstrating that there is a better way to live, that you can live with less, that there are practical skills that will enhance your life that go beyond mere consumption of goods and services. And so I think the creation of this culture, whether it happens through promoting cooperatives or promoting simple living, is something that needs to happen. It's absolutely required. So I feel pretty good about what I'm doing. But I don't do it because of that. I don't do it because I want to make the world a better place. OK, I do. But the reason I do it is because it's deeply rewarding. And I have this um, hypothesis, a pretty strong one, that things that we find deeply rewarding in a really meaningful way are also going to be good for the world. And I'm reminded of this quotation by Howard Thurman, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive, and then go do it, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. So to summarize, human ecology in this construction that I've uh, created involves disciplinary depth and expertise, augmented by new questions and perspectives within the discipline, such as ecological economics and new institutional economics, use of what I call border disciplines. For me, that's sociology, anthropology, psychology, things like that and deep engagement with and in the world. Okay. I think this is, do people want to see that a little longer? OK, there we go. Sure. OK. Some of these ideas are captured by a graphic that one of you all provided to me. Uh, and I think sort of what I'm talking about here is that when we sort of are new to the world, new to the idea of intellectual exploration, we, t we can easily think of the world as like this. It's sunny, it's bright, there's lots of flowers. And then you learn some things about the world and you find out that it's not quite like that. You read some books and watch too many documentaries and instead of having this bright, shiny world, you see that there's darkness and horror in the world. The key thing is, is you can't stop there. You have to keep going. And if you keep going and keep studying and watching too many documentaries, you eventually see that the world is a little bit different than this dark, horrible place, that even with the darkness and the horror, there's still wonderful things out there. The best things in life will always be making the world a better place. It will always be helping people or helping animals or helping forests, creating something beautiful, putting smiles on the faces of children or elderly, or people who are differently abled, people who are incarcerated. That's always going to be what makes the world a better place. And when you understand that within the world, you can find joy and purpose, even if there's all this horror. So I think that's an important part of human ecology. And this construction allows that. Always in the slideshow with a sunrise. This is actually, well, always in a slideshow with a sunset. This is actually a sunrise uh, near my office sky the color of a bruised pomegranate. <laughs> I promised my section I would use the expression sky the color of a bruised pomegranate. So I got it in. 